I think there's kind of like no greater act of love than telling someone that they can do something mm -hmm. and believing in them and supporting them and giving them the confidence to, to go out there and just try. Um, I, it, it hits me so deeply because, you know, that's what we, that's what we're all doing here, right? Like we are believing, hoping against hope that this is something that we can pursue to its fullest. This is not a short answer. I am so sorry. It's a wonderful answer. I want to start with you, Brie. Um, because I feel like the project starts with you. So I wonder if you can just tell everybody the story about how you found the project and maybe lead into what it means to be executive producer and number one on the call sheet. <laughs> how much time do we have? <laughs> so half hour. How much truth can I tell? So um, it, it was, the book was sent to me and it was at a time, you know, I... I take a long time between projects. I guess there's a version where I don't take a long time between projects, but I'm um, very picky and I feel like the things that I want to do, I want to be just in love with and you don't get to decide and it's not multiple times a year when that happens to me. And so I was, I don't know, a year or two into not working and sort of feeling like, okay, well, gosh, maybe I'm not going to make anything anymore maybe that's just I don't mean that as a sad thing I feel like as an actor I'm a tool and I'm here to to do what I'm meant to do and to be part of the stories I'm meant to be a part of and you know at some point maybe that won't be I won't be needed anymore and so I thought maybe that was the case and and then you know you never know what the day brings and um, true in the actor's lifestyle it's always that like it's just around the corner and that will drive you crazy until it doesn't um, <laughs> and then one day I got an email for this book that wasn't coming out for two more years which felt like an eternity away and it was very quickly that I read it and was just immersed in Bonnie's writing and this incredible character Elizabeth Zott and I'm not even certain I finished the book I think I, within 40 pages, emailed and was like, I want to talk about this. Obviously, finish the book before those conversations. <laughs> and we were off to the races and pitched it out and had to have a lot of great, lively conversations about what that would be. And um, it took a long time. It took many, many years. Um, by the time we were editing, the book had come out. So it was a lovely little secret for me. And then I got to, you know, have the enjoyment of panicking once the book came out and everybody loved it and going like, oh gosh, I can't change anything now. Um, and, uh, but, you know, Bonnie had seen it and was very happy with it. So that was that. In terms of producing, um, I was very involved in it. Um, I'm somebody that when I do something, I'm just like completely all in. And so it was probably, you know, at least 16 hour days for a really long time because I was prepping it, developing it, which became an incredible way to understand this character better because you get to have conversations with department heads about what they believe her apartment looks like. And then you go, oh, I hadn't thought about her that way. It's great to know. Um, and we got to tell this story together. Um, but then the thing with TV is you're kind of doing everything at once. So I'm used to, as the film goes on, yes, you're getting more tired, but you feel like, okay, I'm not drowning because I know what this character is. And now I, I cruise, I play. It's like beginning scary, middle's a grind, end is the final push. And I, that was not how TV works. <laughs> Actually, how TV works is it just gets harder and harder and harder when you're a producer. Because as you're continuing, you're filming on set and you're getting the new scripts in for the next block, which needs to get completed and needs notes done at a certain time. So you're frantically reading things. And then you're like, we're good, though. You know, I got the next block scripts done. And then you're getting cuts for the episodes coming at the same time. And so then any spare moment I had, I was editing. Weekends, I was editing. Um, my best friend, Courtney, did all of the food for the show. And I was having her step in and do hand shots um, so that I could leave and go to the edit. And it was just... Um, the most beautiful madness, I would say. There was like one day I had like half a day off and I was in bed and I was like watching the live stream of what was happening on set. I had an iPad that had the next script on it and on my computer I was watching dailies and I was like, am I okay? <laughs> am I great at this or have I lost it? Um, 
but it was just great fun. It was a world that I was obsessed with and didn't want to stop until it was right. Sounds perfect. And then just before we move on, a little bit about being number one on, on the call sheet and the responsibility that comes with that in yeah. terms of y- your company of actors. Sure, sure. So I think that I I lean into a concept with that that I, I don't know I experience very much on set, which is um, I believe that as number one on the call sheet, you are the head of the department. And so, of course, that means all the normal things you would consider of holding yourself to a high caliber and standard and being prepared and being courteous. Um, But I also feel like it's a way of becoming close with your fellow actors on your set and understanding what their needs are. Um, Even simple things like actors are all have their own tricksy ways of getting to the scene, you know. And like for me, I know that I'm kind of like a pusher, so like take one for me will be like I'm gassing it, and that can be a little unnerving to people. And then for some, especially for somebody who's like really getting the groove on take seven, it's like then you feel like you'll get the scene, it'll cut, but it'll always feel like you're not in the same scene at the same time. So having those types of conversations, and um, in particular, trying to get a group of actors to have whether it was like you know, gelling or having a deep backstory or like the receptionist having a familiarity, the scientist having a familiarity. I started um, a game table and I brought all these games and I would um, put people together with certain games. So I'd be like, okay, all you scientists, you got to go on this table and you're going to do boggle together. And you'd see all of them, you know, in between takes kind of like "Mm -hmm -hmm," yelling at each other, whatever. And then it just bleeds into the scene. And Maybe it's also because I selfishly don't like small talk, so I would much prefer <laughs> to play games than, you know, talk about the weather that we're not seeing because we're in a soundstage. But that was, um, became, I think, I don't know. It felt like a very big part of the job. Um, it was like we were making a show, but also it was it was game time. Yeah. <laughs> right? No, it was amazing. Yeah. It was really, well, yeah. just hearing you talk right now about like just all the responsibilities and the things that you were managing and I remember watching you like manage that but you were you were always so light about it on set like oh yeah I gotta check out this script and I'm gonna get involved in this edit but hey who wants to play this over here you know and it was (laughs) there was just like such a such a warmth and such a gentleness and I it, it did create this energy in the space and not just only with the actors like with the entire crew it was it was a really beautiful, well-oiled machine because it felt like a team. You know, we were all like on the same team. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what it is, is I don't believe in casting crew. I think that that and has just ruined us from the beginning. Um, and I think there's animosity that comes with both sides of that and a lot of misunderstanding. And so I I think being a producer makes that sort of an effortless thing where people just kind of see that I'm going back and forth. But if that's not the case, having that in your mind while you're working to understand that I like to just admit the truth, which is that we're in a team sport. And until we're able to all identify that and not be so self-centered, um, then I think we'll have a better time. Thank you. I want to talk to you both about sort of digging in and the kind of research that you both did for your characters, bearing in mind that this was taking place in the 50s and 60s, and you both have very different storylines. Let's start with Asia. How did you dig into that research? Yeah, um, well, they brought in a a cultural consultant, Dr. Shamel Bell, who spent a lot of time with me, and she was fascinating to talk to. She was so sweet, Um, but also just this well of knowledge, and she really... She really spelled out for me what that time kind of felt like and also helped, you know, just to show me to the some resources to really understand, like, you know, the the thinking behind, like, the, the freeway project and the understanding of all these housing covenants that kept neighborhoods segregated and why these people were able to move into this neighborhood and how these worlds could collide and all of that. So that was... That was really great to get into. And then for me, I, I thank God for YouTube. I was able to find like just a lot of sound samples of like black women speaking in that time period because I was trying to figure out what Harriet should sound like because I, I just didn't want her to sound like me. And I 
had this belief that someone like her would have migrated, you know, from the East Coast or from the South, where she would have gone to like a historically black college and then come this way for more opportunities and only to realize like it's just a different kind of racism and, you know, going West. Um, also, I had already read this book by Isabella Wilkerson, um, the... <sighs> The Sun. Does anyone know this book? Isabella Wilkerson. She wrote, uh, it was about the Great Migration. The Sun. No. Oh, I'm, I've failed myself. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we <both> failed you. <laughs> um, uh, but it is a fascinating book and a wonderful uh, writer, and you should all look her up. <laughs> Um, but so there was there was just a lot of that and just like finding the sound and the posture and the feel and talking to uh, Dr. Bell and to my my mom about like what her grandmothers and great aunts were like in this time period and and just just getting a sense of the what that energy felt like of what it is to kind of in a way put on a character so that you could protect yourself and kind of navigate how you wanted people to perceive you in this world you know, because there's the very negative stereotypes and assumptions that you were battling against, you had to present yourself in such a way that was in defiance of that. And it's funny, because even as I'm talking about it, I feel myself, you know, lifting lifting up into Harriet. And, and that's that's how I felt like she existed. Um, yeah, and that was, that was kind of the crux of it for me. I love that, though. And I was wondering, because we're literally a few miles away from the Adams neighborhood where this happened, and I know that you're from California. Um, I love that you talk about your mother and talking about your grandmothers, because I think it's brilliant as an actress when you can tap into your ancestors. It's really grounding. And, and I wonder if you can share, you know, did, did you know because you were from here about this freeway project before? Uh, so I'm from California and I did not know about this before. Thank you, California School System. <laughs> um, but these things, a lot of these things are not taught, you know, it's very, it's very purposeful. Um, my, my mother grew up on the East Coast and, uh, so she was, it was great to like hear her stories and the kinds of things that, you know, just from her as a kid and the way like she told me about like always following her great aunt to some department store and watching her like get a cup of tea and just be a lady who lunched and, you know, like just have, have like putting on that kind of air, um, and what, what I also love, like talking of like the collaboration of, you know, the set and the crew and everything is that set deck populated my house with pictures of my family, like from from that time period, which also just felt amazing to like walk into the space and like, oh, and there's my mom's baby picture, <laughs> you know, and there's like my aunt's graduation photo and my grandmother when she was getting married. So it's like they were literally with me and that kind of personalization, it, it, it is incredibly grounding and meaningful and just it's so collaborative and feels really wonderful. Did you have? The warmth of other the sons. The thank warmth you. of other sons. Thank you. You're a winner. <laughs> thank you. The warmth of other sons. Incredible book. Everyone should read it. We're all adding it to the reading list. And um, Bree, I'm assuming you don't come from a family of scientists. <laughs> no, no. I come from like rodeo people. Like it's not like we're not scientists. Um, uh, no, the science was the biggest thing for me to understand. I would say that her, who she was, sort of her voice, how she stood, all of that to me was always so clear from the book. I don't even remember needing to really like think about that. I, I knew who she was, um, but there were these other parts of her that I just was like, I don't, I, I couldn't possibly relate, um, especially being, uh, first of all, talking about science, um, <laughs> talking about science with authority, just memorizing it. I mean, to be blunt, it's like, you know, a page or two of, you know, pyrimidines and purines and things that I'm like, this is because her intelligence on this subject is so beyond what I could have figured out in two years. You know what I mean? It's not like I, I could have 
at first I was like, oh, I'll go take some college courses online. And I was like, I, where am I going to begin? Like, I finished in high school. Like, I got to start back with, like, humidity and, like, things like that. And, like, I don't know. So it just was like, no, I need to just learn what we're doing for this. So anytime I was talking about the science stuff, we had science consultants. I spoke with a lot of different scientists even ahead of time about you know, what, what these things mean so that I understood the general, like how to have authority and and excitement over what it was. But really it was like, I'm picturing for myself, the things that I light up talking about and the way that I fall in love with different things. And I can pull someone in with something I'm interested in. And so you find these ways to connect it to yourself, um, which was incredible. Um, and I would say the most difficult part for me also with um the science part is is that I can't I am outing myself with this stuff and I'm like don't do what I do okay (laughs) don't do this but I cannot memorize things ahead of time and that is hard when you have two pages of science jargon it's very difficult um I happen to memorize very fast my my thing, my quirk is that I have to memorize it in the space, in the location with the people and the every, then it like clicks. I do a rehearsal and it's all there, but I really tried. I was like, this is the one Brie you have to lay in bed and do the thing. You need to like run them with your mom. You need to like stare at a wall, like do all the things. And I, it just didn't work. It ended up being a waste of time for me. So it was, um, kind of scary and fun. You watched episode two. So I think that starts with me talking a lot about that. Yeah, that was, it felt crazy to me because, you know, I'm there at six in the morning and I'm like, I've been pushing, you know, it's like playing chicken with myself. I'm like, I'm really pushing this to the limit of like, I know I can't memorize this ahead of time and I have to do it now um, on a TV schedule, which is very, very fast, but it all worked out fine. And actually Lee found it very fun um, that I could do it. So it was like every time I would, you know, maybe get two pages done correctly and on time then the next script would come and it'd be like three pages and then it was like by the time I got to the end we had like a 12 page thing and I was like Lee come on I mean we don't um, nobody nobody needs this I don't need this I'm tired you know but it was it was fun to push yourself but that's also such a great trick because I was thinking when we saw this scene in the PhD interview I was like I don't understand anything she's saying and yet at the same time I understand exactly what she's saying And it is that thing of making people interested in what you're interested in. I think that's a brilliant. Yeah, no, it's really, I mean, a lot of the time we're all talking. No one knows what we're talking about. You know, it's just like, no, I'm just going, uh-huh, uh-huh. It's just like, it's that's fine, you know? And it, it, those are the things when you're developing the show, you're like, okay, when we talk about science, how do we do that? And do we have to, do we have to really make this in a way that people have to understand? And I'm like, I'm, I don't, I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to get people to love the way that she loves and the show is just about love and so you're just like you're just on the ride and I find it to be very endearing when you're just like I don't know what she's saying but like cute you know it's just it's nice you outed me um (laughs) and talking about you know how long you had to get used to the science of it one of the things that struck me about Harriet Sloan is that it's such a massive departure from the book had you read the book before you auditioned or saw the script and and so and and was the script enough for you to build the character um I I was I read the book I did read the book I read the book um I'm like, I saw, I was brought in to play a different character, a character that ended up not existing. So I had read the book before that, but that character also did not exist in the book. So it didn't matter. Like <laughs> producing is fun. Like, right? <laughs> and then, and I think Brie and Lee were like, ah, uh, you know, like this book is so popular. Harry's such an important character. Like you'd be doing a disservice to what this author had created by not like honoring like the role Harriet played in this story of, of of being someone to build community with, having that loving relationship with. Um, and so then, you know, I became Harriet and I've completely forgotten what the question is now. <laughs> it was just, you know, about drawing from the script. But I think what you... Yeah, it was like, was there enough from the script? And it's like, well, it had to be. Yes. <laughs> I will just say um, is that I feel like Asia had the most difficult task to me. I felt like I was just 
you want to talk about making things look easy. It's just like, I felt like she was, had so much complexity to hold as a character that is, um, it's like she just has layer and layer and layer and is representing something that is deeply important about this period of time. And to do it in the way that she did, it was like, there's nobody else I know. Like, and I just, I'm just in love with her, you know? Can't wait to uh, to watch this taping back so I can just play that part over and over again. <laughs> the truth. Thank you, my friend. Yeah, yeah, let it sink in. But it does, all of this is speaking to this relationship because as you say, the one thing that is true to the book is the relationship where you both are so supportive each, of each other. And I think the scene that we don't see here, and I, I, I think I can spoil things because everybody, yeah, okay. I won't. I'm just, so I'll just say when you come in during the card game, you know, there are so many scenes between the two of you and also the scene at the end where I really see, you know, Harriet supporting Elizabeth, Harriet supporting Elizabeth, Harriet supporting Elizabeth. And then I think at the end, we really see Elizabeth massively supporting Harriet in a way that's so meaningful. Mm -hmm. So can you, I mean, it's built scene after scene after scene. How did you build it? No, it is, it is really beautifully built with each scene. And, and that was actually one of the things that I loved. We have a lot of these intimate scenes that could have just been like me asking her a bunch of questions and being like, yeah, you, well, let's talk about you some more. But, <laughs> you know, Exposition, cool. Ex uh -huh. like, right, that's great. But like instead, like a lot, of, a lot of the dialogue to these scenes were invested in like exploring and discovering more about me, which is why this relationship did feel so organically built and why why I was able to believe like when we get to episode six and everything that happens there and they have like this, you know, very radically honest conversation with one another. Like I believe there's a comfort and a safety in in saying all of that because we had built all these other scenes where we share so much about each other's lives and and care so much and involve ourselves with each other's children. And there's just it's it. It was truly earned. Like I felt like we really earned it, and I'm just really proud of of what we created for for giving it that weight. Yeah, palpable. I want to give some flowers to Lewis Pullman because you both have complex and wonderful relationships with him. He's also Emmy nominated, as you both are. So, can you both talk a little bit about how your characters interacted and how you interacted as actors to to bring those stories to life with Lewis? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, oh, Lewis is just so adorable. <laughs> I just love him. Uh, he's such a sweetheart, and that that made that kind of genuine friendliness between our characters, I think, read very easily, you know. And th uh, there was just kind of this energy, almost as if like he was a, like a stray puppy that Harriet had like brought into her family, you know. <laughs> like, and it's and it and it just felt so so wonderful. Just such a great um, actor to play opposite of, and. Yeah, and then like and and you know the character, not Lewis himself. When the character disappoints Harriet, you know I, you know, especially knowing like in episode two that that scene, like knowing like he's gonna die after this, it was devastating doing that scene because I feel so bad. I'm like, this is your friend. You don't even know it, which is true. Like you never know it's when it's gonna be the last time you see someone. So. Don't hold grudges, people. Um, and like, and I think that is the lesson in that moment for Harriet, and that's why in the next episode she's trying so hard to kind of do right by him in some way because of that. But but yeah, working with Lewis was great, and I loved the way our characters appear together. Yeah, and I think also it's brilliant the way he reflects upon you. You just know Harriet is so graceful because of the way she deals with him. It's wonderful. Now, this episode that we just watched, episode two, it's a love story. It could be a film by itself. It's almost your whole love story. Mm -hmm. So what conversations did you have before you played? Not many, honestly. It wasn't, it, we didn't talk that much before filming. I think we had one Zoom with Sarah. 
Um, I know. I think people think you have to like really churn for this, but like it was TV, guys. It's like you have to move kind of fast. You're like, figure it out. But it was very nerve wracking um, because we all agreed that we wanted to tell a love story in the in the ways that we understood them to be, not in ways that felt very plot driven. Um, and so it's tricky. It was I was very nervous about that because to me, it's like the rest of the show doesn't really work unless you believe in this love and this love lost and the impact of that and how this devastation actually ultimately becomes the thing that opens her heart up more than anything else. But how do you do that in, you know, a very, very short amount of time in a way that feels true and sweet and earned? So uh, we got very lucky, I think, in that way that we had Sarah as our director who was very um, interested in letting things take its time, like letting the scenes have breath to them. And so you feel this sense of like that they're looking at each other and it's like time is standing still. Um, you have like Courtney who did the food, which became this incredible visual language. You have um, them spending this this time in the lab together, which you know Elizabeth loves so much. But I mean, there's always, and I think this is um, a, a point of the show, which is for two scientists that care so much about trying to make everything right and understand the world and understand everything, life just comes and sweeps you off your feet. It's a very romantic planet, I found. And so I think that's kind of what happened with the show too, is that it was like, there's all the things we could have planned and then there's just the the thing that just kind of happens and you're just like, oh, thank goodness, you know, we, we did it. And, um, and to your point, it was like, geez, you know, I had to do the scene where I'm like making an omelet and he's like, I don't even pay attention to him. And he's like, I'm going to walk the dog. Bye. And I'm like, okay, bye. And I was like, oh God, <laughs> you know, but you're just like, you can't even go there. You can't even go there. You're just like, nope, you just want to walk the dog. You know, it, it's, it just, oh, those are the parts of our job where it's like, it makes you stare into the void a little bit. And you're like, oh my gosh, I forgot that these are possibilities of life. Um, and then I'd be like, I just want to remember Christmas, the Christmas where we were running around with the toys. That was a great day. Love that montage day. Um, we played a lot of games, I would say in the short time that we had, cause we didn't have any real rehearsal time or anything. Uh, we would play, uh, code names, which was really fun because it's like one word, really focusing on one another. It worked really well for us. We played that quite a bit and we were quite good at it. Um, and yeah, that was, you know, it was, it was a month of, of the shoot. And then it felt like once that piece settled, even though I felt a lot of apprehension because everything changed for me after that, you know, it's a, it's a different director and suddenly it's a different set. And I'm, I'm now working with Asia, all these, it was all these different characters. And I felt this like, oh gosh, I just got comfortable. I just figured out this character and now I have to change it all. Um, but it then just set me up for the rest of it to just really fall into the experience of the show of this feeling that everything was moving, that if I, I loved a scene, it was going to be over in two hours. And if I was doing something that was, you know, uncomfortable to do, it was going to be over in two hours. And to live in that, then you, you, I found presence again in the work to just be there and whatever it was we were filming um, and enjoy it because it was going to be gone no matter what. That's a great way to describe the joy of the fast process. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I want to talk to you both a little bit because you have such great scenes together just about coverage because I'm wondering for you as well, both as an actress and you said earlier, you spent a long, lot of time in the edit. You also talked about, you know, the difference of some actors between scene one and scene seven. So I'm wondering how it worked for you on this set when, you know, were you feeling like your performance was different when it was someone else's coverage? And, and how did that feel? And then how did it look? Did you, were you ever surprised when you watched the edit to see, are you ever still surprised when you see yourself that the performance wasn't what you would, doesn't look the way you thought it might? I don't think about my face ever. <laughs> uh, I, how do I answer that? Do I think, well, no, I would say that I'm very consistently surprised by what comes out of me in a given scene. I'm not somebody who has a ton of plan. So I think like episode three is a very good um, example of this where it's this episode where I'm, I'm processing all this grief and I was surprised while I was 
filming that, that there were certain things that made me feel emotional and things that we had set up to be an emotional moment that didn't. And it was just what was there. It was like, oh, actually, like this little like, mm. and some of it was like when I open up the, sorry if I'm spoiling something, but I open a box, okay? I open a box and I look at some stuff. It was like I had set some things for myself. I was like, I know there's a couple of things that I that I know will make me feel something. But then there was a bunch of other stuff that I didn't know about. And so it was like I got to kind of partially help myself and partially have the surprise of it. Um, so... I'd say in the edit, also I'll stay with the grief episode example, I needed a lot of support with um, just allowing other people to tell me if it was working, if the episode was working. When when you have almost an entire episode where I hardly talk and I'm just kind of like looking at a dog or a frog or a baby and like feeling numb inside, you're just like, is this working or no? Because I can't feel my own performance. So it's easier when it's plots and things like that. I'm like kind of a whiz with it. But if it's just kind of hinging on my performance, I'm like, well, you figured that part out. You know, like I'm not going to sit here and try and like make myself get emotional over my own performance. No, thanks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my coverage. <laughs> well, I was, I was going to say, uh, you know, Unless, you know, most of the time I feel like unless it's an emotional scene, I never know whose coverage is going to go first, you know. So if like if the camera's going to be on her first, well, then everything I do with her is kind of a rehearsal. I mean, it's always a rehearsal. Everything's a rehearsal because I don't know what they're going to pick. So it's, you know, um, and it's just very much like how can I deepen this connection and still somewhat do the same things, but still find something new and be human and present, even if it's not on me, like, cause you know, we're, we're playing with each other. So it has to be alive and real and giving someone something to react to. And, and I mean, honestly, my best takes are when the camera's not on me. <laughs> I think, I think a lot of actors feel that way though. <laughs> You know, um, and then when it is on me, just trying to not be obsessive about the fact that oh, now the camera's on me, and I want to still be a human being in the scene and continue that that rehearsal. Um, and then what I loved, I mean, because all of our directors were just so amazing, um, and if it was going to be something emotional, normally I feel like a director will do you the kindness of asking you if you want your coverage first or second to depending on like what you've got built up inside of you. Um, and you know, on any given day, who knows how I, I never know how I'm going to feel until it's like happening. Uh, but, but yeah, it is, it's, I don't, I don't, it's like, it's, it's just, everything's an opportunity, right? It's always just an opportunity to try and figure it out. And sometimes, yeah, you might figure it out and your coverage is done and the camera's not on you and you're like, ah, but that's what it was. And that's, that's what it is. And you just kind of let it go and move on. And luckily TV does move so fast that I, I don't think you even have time to really obsess or it's not good to obsess you because you've got to move on to the next scene. So and you just kind of keep that in mind and, and, you know, just, yeah, keep pushing forward, right? Like, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everything's an opportunity. Um, before we leave, I want to get to a, at least one or two audience questions, which we've sure, gathered. Yeah. No, we can also talk Marvelous. like shorter, so <laughs> yes. we can get to a couple of them. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah. So Bailey Talking G, this questions. question is for both of you. In Lessons in Chemistry, Elizabeth Spot, Zot, sorry, inspires and teaches her audience through Supper at Six. What lesson did you take away from being a part of this show? Oh, I'm like so many. Can I say one of my most favorite parts of this show? I want to, oh, sorry for whoever hasn't seen it, but there's, and it was in the book too, which I really love. There was a moment where, um, uh, Elizabeth Sod is like doing a thing and takes a question from the audience and this and starts talking to this woman and this this woman is kind of detailing things in a very like medically precise way and and Elizabeth is just like oh well you should become a doctor and it's like well I can't do that and she's like yeah you start with the library and medical school and and like and it's a scene that made me cry in the book and it made me cry when I watched it yeah. because that kind of support 
and believing in someone. And I, I genuinely, I take that from this show. Just, I, I, I think there's kind of like no greater act of love than telling someone that they can do something and believing in them and supporting them and giving them the confidence to, to go out there and just try. Um, I, it, it hits me so deeply because, you know, that's what we, that's what we're all doing here, right? Like we are believing, hoping against hope that this is something that we can pursue to its fullest. This is not a short answer. I am so sorry. It's a wonderful answer. We're very verbose. We can't, we can't help ourselves. I know, we're just, you're getting a lot from us tonight. I don't know what to say. Any big takeaways? Well, I kind of said it. My okay. honestly, like my yeah, big yeah. one was just I was like, "Wow, time it just keeps going." Um, <laughs> but the other piece, having lived so much through Elizabeth, is is that, gosh, when you just think that you just can't anymore, you can. Woohoo! I love that. Yes. All right. Last question from Archibald. We all get down sometimes. What's your preferred method for cheering yourself up? Am I on set and I need to cheer up or am I at home? Uh, Is it different answers? Well, yeah. I mean, honestly, I think when you're an actor, like, and you're, especially when you're, like, on the active job, like, you have to have a lot of tricks up your sleeve lots of things and some of it is like a song some of it is um like puppy videos or you know it's like you actually it's part of how i prepare for a character to be quite honest is exit strategies always it's like you have to know how to get out i know that i love getting into the character but like who's helping me get out just me i'm the only one you know so you have to have a way that when you are whether it's like getting in your car at the end of the day and you have that kind of sinking lonely feeling or you get home or you're in like a random apartment in somewhere that's not your home, like you have to have ways that make you feel comfortable. So it changes for me. You know, I love video games. I love singing. Um, I love cooking, but I'll usually find something that I'm like, okay, this is the designated tool that I'm using this time so that I know when I'm back with myself. Um, yeah, I'm like that was really great. <laughs> it's helping me remember. Like, I'm prepping something now. I'm like, I gotta do that. I haven't yeah, done that yet. Like, that's Am I gonna so do wonderful. knitting? What am I gonna do? Yeah, I mean, I guess yeah. It's um yeah, being able to uh, shift one's perspective, which can be really challenging. But I I do find like yeah, like you're saying, an exit like because med meditation or music, just mm -hmm. something, and and also like verbally like changing the thoughts in my head, like because a lot of the time I find my brain like just thinking, oh, I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do this, and like, I get to do this, I get to do this, mm -hmm. I get to do this. Mm -hmm. It's to occupy the space is such a privilege, and I always want to come at it from a place of gratitude, and even when the hours are long, and I have to say the. The pandemic and the strike really helped reground me in my gratitude for this because it was just taken away all of a sudden. And it was like, oh my God, that thing that I took for granted is like no one can do it anymore. Like, and when will this end? And um, so it was great to be able to come back to it and be like, oh, it's another long day on the set that I love. I get to do this. <laughs> yeah. Great lessons in life. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming out.